uh, between Canada and uh, Latin America and everybody else around the world who's joined us. We have uh, close to 100 uh, registrants. Um, this is the outcome of uh, some meetings that we had with the International Pollination Symposium in Cholula in Mexico some years ago through the International Commission on Plant Pollinator Relations and uh, sponsored by the uh, Canadian uh, Pollination Initiatives um, funded through the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. Uh, without further ado, we'll um, let you know that Dr. Les Ship from Agricultural and Agri-Food Canada will be our first speaker, followed by Carlos Vergara uh, from Universidad de las Americas in Mexico and uh, Patricia Silva, who's in Puerto Alegre in Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. And uh, after following that, we'll have some opportunity for discussion. So thank you for joining us. and. Uh, We'll uh, see how much fun we can have. So I'll turn it over to Les now. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. This morning I'm going to talk about the status of greenhouse crop pollination in Canada. I'm going to first give you a little update on the history, uh, on the status of the industry. I'll talk a little bit about the issues, past and present, and then I will talk a little bit about the research that we've done in greenhouse pollination. The, you can see here that the uh, industry is a very viable industry. It's been growing at a rate of about 5% per year over the last uh, 10 years. The area you can see is, is 1,230 hectares, uh, about uh, 3,000 acres. And most of the industry is located in Ontario. Two-thirds of the industry is Ontario. And that, uh, the, although the acreage may seem low c compared to some other areas, we have very high-tech uh, greenhouses. Most of the acreage is tomato, 42%, followed by uh, pepper, sweet pepper, and then cucumber. And of course, the pollination is with uh, all the tomatoes are pollinated by bees and some of the acreage of pepper. The greenhouses in Ontario can be quite substantial in size, uh, almost uh, 3.5 hectares. In fact, some of the uh, operations are more like 40, 50 hectares in operation in size. So they're quite uh, big. The farm gate value is $1.1 billion. And the U.S. is our largest market for greenhouse vegetables. Over 70% of the product is shipped to the U.S. Now, I had down here the types of greenhouses that we have in Canada. In Ontario, we originally had a lot of double uh, polyethylene uh, plastic greenhouses. That was because it was cheaper to construct. And more recently, since the price of uh, construction has gone down for glass, a lot of the new greenhouses are glass. And the other thing I like to point out is that the height from the ground to the gutter is about uh, 7.6 uh, meters, so 25 feet, so it's quite substantial. And this has been growing, and I'll come back to this later to show you how it's actually very important for greenhouse pollination. The bumblebees, of course, Bombus impatiens, is the species used in Canada, and this is a native species. Also, uh, we've been using bumblebees since I would say the early 1990s. In fact, Canada was a leader in developing bumblebees as a new pollination uh, mechanism for greenhouse tomatoes. And in fact, most of the bees uh, that we get, the hives, come from two main suppliers. That is uh, Copert, as you see down here, and BioVest. Now, best management practices for bumblebee pollination. There's some very good websites by Copert, BioVest, uh, even Can Pollen has put up some information on just you know the best practices for pollination. We use about five to ten uh, hives per acre in tomatoes, and half of that, so that uh, two to uh, five hives in peppers. Now the issues, as I mentioned in Ontario, the earlier construction is uh, was mostly double polyethylene plastic, and they put UV inhibitors in there to reduce the amount of gray mold in the greenhouses. But when you put the UV into the plastic, what happens is it changed the spectrum of the light that was coming through the plastic. So normally, natural daylight is white. 
but when you remove some of the blue wavelengths, it appears yellow to the bees, and this caused disorientation. But with work with the plastic producers, we're able to actually reduce the amount of UV inhibitors into the plastic, and of course with the more of the construction, recent construction of glass houses, this isn't a problem. Now with early season production, especially when we had the lower gutter height greenhouses, the venting could be a problem. What happened is your crop was close to your, your gutter vents, your side vents, as the bees were pollinating, and the vents, if they were open, they would see the white light. And of course, they would go to the light and leave the greenhouse. Then you would, of course, have the vents would be closing and the, greens, the bees would be left outside and couldn't get back in. Now, with the higher gutters, you don't have this problem in the plastic houses. And also, a lot of the plastic houses have gone from the Gothic to a peak venting. It's more like uh, you would think you'd see with your Dutch Venlo greenhouses. And this has alleviated the problem because the bees aren't up at that height and therefore they're not leaving the greenhouses. Now one of the other issues that growers have faced, and of course this is something that all growers worldwide face, is compatibility of pesticides with using bees. And we know that there is not, most pesticides are not compatible bee friendly. And especially when some of the growers were using things such as imidacloprid, which had a very long residual life. So they stopped doing that, but we had a problem with some of our propagators occasionally using imidacloprid when they're growing the transplants. And of course, with the long uh, residual life, when this came back to the actual growers, these transplants, there was an issue with bee pollination. And of course, it interfered with biological control. So this is an education process to make sure the propagators, which we're now getting them to switch to biological control. Now, when it comes to best management practices for hive husbandry, as I mentioned, there's a lot of good information on the internet, but in Canada, some of the growers keep their hives way too long in the greenhouses. The hive, uh, hive life uh, span is, is basically 8 to 10, uh, 12 weeks in the greenhouse. The, the uh, hive producers, they give enough uh, sugar water in the hives for up to 12 weeks. But some of the growers were keeping the hives for, oh, 14, 16 weeks, or even they just keep the hives permanently in the greenhouse until the crop is taken out. And of course, this can cause an issue with uh, the older bees and that, that you can get disease issues as the hive is winding down, parasites, you also have drones, you have multiple queens that could be moving outside. So this is a practice that we're trying to educate the growers to remove the hives after 12 weeks. Now in Canada, a new issue uh, that is starting to creep in with the growers is, is the pollination under supplemental lighting. The growers would like to have year-round production of greenhouse crops. This is to maintain their market share. Now we know from work done in Europe with uh, Bombus terrestris that there can be some issues with supplemental lighting. They didn't work and they mentioned that they should only be, the hives should only be open during the daylight hours. However, in Canada, we have done some work here at my research center in Harrow, and you can see here that we took a look at in a greenhouse, we had a tomato crop, we put a hive in there, it was 30 to 40 workers, and we put HPS lights in one greenhouse, and we had natural lighting in another greenhouse, and you could see, of course, Without the HPS, they came out just during the daylight hours. But when we turn the HPS lights on from 1 a.m. to 1,700 hours, you could see we got activity of the bees. So the bees were active when the lights were on. So the next question is, how does this affect bee pollination, fruit yield, and quality? Well, we found that actually, when you use the supplemental lighting, you can see you almost got twice as many clusters of tomatoes. This, the cultivar we used was uh, Clarence. It's a tomato on the vine. And you can see that we got many more clusters using the bees under high pressure sodium lights. And also when we harvested the fruit that was bee pollinated, you can see that it was weighing more and we got more seeds. So in this case, actually, with Bombus and Patience, you may increase production using supplemental lighting. Now, some of the research that was done a few years ago with a master student, uh, Andrew Morris, this was uh, a student of uh, 
myself and, and Peter, we looked at floral scent in the greenhouse and how did that affect pollination. We actually found a negative relationship between scent and foraging. In other words, when the scent was down and the two components that we actually found, floral scents that was important, were beta philandrin and 2 carotene. So if their level was down, pollination was up. And this was with the tomato cultivar uh, clearance. So the other thing that we had found too is that pollination can be improved by managing the tomato growth conditions, the plant conditions. By that I mean we found with generative plants we actually had higher pollination and lower amounts of the uh, beta philandrin and the two carotene being released. So this is a little different. Uh, it's almost uh, we found that these two uh, chemicals are actually used as a repellent to pests. So this may help explain it, but we need to do more research to fully understand this phenomena. And some of the other work that we did with bee pollination was actually with uh, Patricia and with her PhD and her visit to Canada in that she looked at the physical vibration characteristics of the bees. That is the frequency and amplitude. And she found first that the Bombus and patients only needs to visit the tomato flower once for adequate pollination and fruit quality. This is really important because growers have a tendency to use too many bees and over, -pop, over pollinate their crop. Now, if you have too much poll uh, pollination, or sorry, too much um, bee visits, you actually can reduce your yield and fruit quality. And we found that the bees were capable of detecting the amount of pollen available in the flower. They did not change their vibrations, physical characteristics, but they actually spent less time with the flower. And the interesting part here, too, that Patricia found is that the size of the bee does not affect the vibration, physical characteristics. So a big bee or a small bee, they still would vibrate at the same frequency and amplitude. And this is really quite important because a lot of times your bees can get smaller as the hive matures. And buzz pollination the frequency and amplitude found could vary with plant species. In fact, with uh, eggplant, uh, egg egg we found that the frequency and amplitude was greater than with tomato. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the main pest management strategy for vegetables in Canada is, is uh, integrated pest management, biological control. And so it, um, this really goes along very good with uh, the use of bumblebees. And we're using microbial agents in Canada. So one of the things that we have done is we have sort of extra value added to the pollination is we have found that if you combine pollination with the distribution of a biocontrol agent, this is, this is a microbial agent, we've got the bees vectoring and it's, it's sort of free for the growers. You get continuous dissemination, that is every time the bee is out pollinating, you are getting delivery of your microbial agent. It's being delivered to the flowers and to the leaves as the bees would, would sit on the, on the leaves to and groom themselves. So there is less going into the soil, air and water. It is more economically friendly because there's less labor involved, less product going out, and it's very compatible with the bio-based IPM programs used. I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of this work. So as a result of all the work we've done, there has been a new company that has uh, been formed in Canada, Bee Vectoring Technology, and as a result, they have developed their own dispenser that is built into the lid of the hive. And you can see the dispenser here, and it has little pegs in it here. As the bees exit out of the hive into the dispenser, they walk around, and they're forced, as they walk around, they will pick up this inoculum on their hairs and their body. They take it out to the flowers, to the leaves, and when they're pollinating, they will then deliver it and it's spread over the crop. When they go back into the hive, they go back in a different hole, so they're not taking the inoculum back into the hive. And of course, over here on this side, you will see BioBest has also developed its own dispenser called the Flying Doctor. And of course, it works on the same principle too. Now just what sort of products have we looked at? Well we've looked at uh, a couple fungal agents, Bavaria bassiana, Botanigard 22WP. We actually got the first label expansion for a microbial agent delivered by 
bees in Canada and I think also worldwide. So this is really important and it's very good against multiple pests. You can see here thrips, uh, ligus, it's also good against um, aphids. So it's a very broad spectrum uh, microbial agent and works quite well. Now also Metarhizium anisoptii, that's another fungal agent and work has been done by actually Tariq Butt and his colleagues in England and also we've been doing some work here to try to get another agent uh, registra registered. And one of the other interesting things we found is Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki, Dipel, the formulation, we found it's very good for delivery against cabbage looper and also there's a new virus that we are now going to register uh, for control of cabbage looper in Canada and we're finding very good results with that. And of course Clonostachus rosei is a plant uh, fungal agent and it's, we found it's very useful against controlling a lot of uh, gray mold. So these are just some of the products that we've been very successful with using and I just wanted to acknowledge a lot of this work of course takes uh, collaboration with partners in academia, with the uh, companies of BioBest, Copert, and of course the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers, and, and many of the other grower organizations that I work with. Thank you. As, uh, as uh, Victoria just uh, deals with all the little details there. Um, come back on and I see we're ready for Carlos to talk to us about all the advances of greenhouse pollination in Mexico. Carlos. Thank you, sir. There's a question for Les. Um, can microbial agents be combined for delivery by the Yes. Yes. yes, yes, certainly it can be combined and uh, we can discuss more of that in the discussion period. Carlos, go ahead. Good morning. In the next few minutes uh, I'll be talking with you about uh, the situation of greenhouse pollination in Mexico. Um, I have to mention that this uh, presentation is a, a joint uh, effort uh, uh, with uh, my three colleagues, uh, Juan Carlos Salinas from CEUSA, which is a, a private company uh, that produces biological control agents and uh, is also interested in um, greenhouse pollination. Uh, also, uh, Alfonso Torres Ruiz from Copper, Mexico, participated in the preparation of this seminar, and uh, Remy Van Dam from El Colegio de la Frontera Sur in Chiapas is another participant. Uh, greenhouse agriculture in Mexico is very important for uh, commercial agriculture. Uh, in 2012, uh, there were about 24,000 hectares of protected agriculture in Mexico. 73% of those uh, were greenhouses and tunnels in plastic and 27 was shade netting which is a different way of managing the land but they can also be included as uh, protected agriculture. And the industry uh, is um, growing uh, very fast at an annual growth rate of uh, over 40% in the period of two th between 2000 and 2012. Uh, protected agriculture in Mexico is relatively recent. It started in the 50s or 60s with floriculture and has been has uh, ex experienced an accelerated growth uh, from 1985, especially in northwest Mexico. The greatest uh, growth period started in 2003. Uh, the industry produces over 3.5 um, million metric tons of produce valued in more than 1.5 billion dollars. Uh, here I, I give you some uh, information on the value of the installed infrastructure, how many jobs are generated directly and in the indirectly. Um, and also as it is the case with Canada, our main buyer is the US. Canada also buys some of uh, the Mexican uh, produce 
and 16% of the uh, production goes to the domestic market. <coughs> the area cultivated um, has been uh, growing, as uh, I mentioned before, especially starting in 2003. And the main crop is uh, tomato, with uh, about 60% of the area. Cucumber is the, the another important crop. Uh, pepper, bell peppers are important too, and other products which I will mention in the following slide. Um, Mexico is the seventh, uh, has the seventh greatest area of protected agriculture in the world, as we show in this um, slide. Uh, the inset shows, uh, maybe you cannot see very well, but it shows a, a big area of um, uh, greenhouses in the state of Sinaloa. The main crops under greenhouse cultivation are, as I mentioned before, tomatoes, 60%, peppers, 14%, cucumber, 12%, and then a miscellaneous uh, combination of uh, aubergines, papaya, strawberry, hot pepper, berries, flowers, and culinary herbs. 50% uh, of the protected uh, surface is within three states, uh, Sinaloa on the Pacific coast here, uh, Jalisco here, uh, and the peninsula of Baja California, both Baja California and Baja California Sur, uh, with uh, the percentages indicated in parentheses. The main pollinators are bees, and the commercial uh, species used since 1994 is bombus impatiens, as is, it is the case in, in Canada too, but uh, in Mexico bombus impatiens is not native, it is used mainly for tomato pollination, but, but it's also used in an important uh, amount for sweet pepper. Uh, the standards of management are uh, management are established by the two companies that produce the, the bumblebees, Copper Mexico and BioBest Mexico. Uh, the colonies are bred since uh, 2009 or 2010 by the two companies at their own facilities. They can produce about 50,000 colonies per year each. And um, they usually manage the uh, bumblebee pollination in greenhouses um, under an integrated pest management system based on biological control, as it is also the case in, in Canada. Um, the main uh, features of this uh, system of management is uh, uh, first introduction of uh, colonies, uh, about uh, one unit, one uh, beehive uh, every 1,500 or 2,000 square meters, and the hives are changed every three weeks. Uh, they monitor, or the producer should monitor percentage of pollination and level of pollination, and uh, the main factors that have been found to be influencing pollination in greenhouses are the use of pesticides and high temperatures inside the greenhouse. The market for um, pollinators in Mexico is growing very rapidly and there is a potential market of approximately 500,000 colonies per year. That was according to the to the area cultivated in 2012. There are um, government programs that are um, aimed to promote growth of protected agriculture in the, in the country. So we have a, a growth of about 1,200 hectares each, each year, which means 12 to 36,000 additional bumblebee colonies requ required each year. The, uh, this uh, graph shows a combination of uh, uh, bombus, bee, bombus impatiens queens imported by, by the producing companies. Bombus, this is the blue line, bombus impatiens colonies imported, and uh, the number of colonies that uh, can be potentially used if we use 10 colonies per hectare per year, or I mean uh, 30 colonies per hectare per year, or 10 colonies per hectare per year. You see uh, that in uh, 2010, there was a drop in the imports of uh, bumblebee impatiens because the, co the companies started to produce the, the bumblebees locally. 
As I mentioned before, the main species use is bombus in patients native to eastern U.S. and Canada, but um, uh, importing exotic uh, species uh, have risks like um, uh, competition for niche with native species and the possibility of uh, uh, pathogens spread. Um, the, uh, in, in Mexico, we have at least two native species which, which have uh, potentials, potential to be used as uh, greenhouse pollinators, and these species are Bombus, Bombus effipiatus and Bombus hantii. The limitations to use these, these uh, species are that uh, we don't know all the breeding steps, especially reproductive behavior needs to be uh, investigated further. Um, both, both native species are seem to be uh, also complexes of regional ecotypes or separate species we don't know yet, so we have to be very careful about moving uh, bumblebees uh, within Mexico because we don't know if we are um, introducing uh, genetic material which, which is not local to, to the areas uh, where it is being used. So we need to regulate movement of colonies or queens inside the country. <coughs> uh, the two companies that are mass producing bumblebees have um, a, a system which uh, uh, consists of closed production at an industrial level following uh, uh, regulation uh, for, for industrial production of a, like any other product, they work under, under a control environment. Um, they also control the quality of inputs, queens, food, reading material. They train their employees, uh, so they have ex experienced teams of employees producing colonies. Uh, the, one of the advantages of this uh, mass production is that they can have a high density of colonies per square meter. Um, but this high density of colonies also needs a very close control of uh, diseases and the written stock. So the control of inputs is checked by, the, by a company lab, at least in the case of Popper, uh, and by an authorized independent lab. The process is also checked uh, internally by the company. And the outputs, then this means the colonies that go out for the market are checked for the presence, presence of uh, pests and diseases both by the company and by, the, by a federal official veterinary lab. Um, a group of uh, Mexican researchers started in 2013 um, a comprehensive research program um, aimed to generate a baseline of Mexican bumblebees on a nationwide um, scale. And the, this program, which is funded by uh, the National Commission on Bio Biodiversity, CONABIO, um, has six components. Uh, the first one is sampling, uh, the second one is uh, taxonomic studies, the third one is aimed at uh, generating a molecular phylogeny of the species uh, present in Mexico. The fourth one is uh, to try to establish what the distribution, sh distribution range of uh, all the species is. Uh, the fifth one is a study on, on the sanitary status of the, of the native species. And the sixth one is a, a breeding program. Some of the results so far are, um, the, are, are presented in this slide. We have uh, almost 8,000 specimens collected from more than 400 sampling, sampling sites all over the country in the last two years. That means uh, 2013 into 2014. Some, uh, it is uh, clear for us that some, uh, some of the species uh, that we have uh, collected are new to science, so we have to work more on that. Um, as far as pathogens are concerned, uh, we have a heterogeneous distribution of uh, pathogens, uh, Nosema and Critidia, 
uh, associated uh, possibly with uh, agricultural practices. This mean, means that the states with a high density or, or high area of uh, greenhouses like uh, Sinaloa seem to harbor more pathogens than other states. Um, also we have in place um, collaboration agreements with uh, uh, another institutions in Mexico, the US and Switzerland, especially in Switzerland we, we are working together with uh, uh, Paul Schmidt Hempel's lab uh, to study uh, pathogen distributions, distributions and prevalence in the country. And finally we have been able to put together an initial draft of uh, red list assessments for the main species in, in Mexico. Um, we have started a dynamic dialogue between all parties, regulators, academy, industry and NGOs involved in the use of pollinators in Mexico and um, we know that the future regulation is very important for the, for the survival and the growth of the um, industry in the country so we, we are trying to collaborate and to base the decision, the decisions that we are uh, taking uh, on research and discussion. Uh, two examples uh, of uh, interaction between industry and academy are uh, agreements between Copper Mexico and the Universidad Autónoma de Querétaro uh, um, through which they carry out research and development programs on biologic and con control and pollination of greenhouse crops and also CEUSA, the other uh, private uh, company participating uh, in, as a presenter in this seminar and the B-Lab at the uh, CUCSUR of Universidad de Guadalajara in Jalisco uh, did have in the past agreements to develop Bombus efipiatus colonies for greenhouse pollination. This same lab also uh, is collaborating with COPERT with the same uh, purpose of uh, developing uh, Bombus efipiatus, the native uh, Mexican species, as a, as a greenhouse pollinator. And finally, uh, the perspectives of greenhouse pollination in Mexico uh, uh, have opportunities and challenges. The main opportunity is that the, the area um, of uh, under cultivation is growing very fast, about 5% per, uh, per year. But we have uh, some challenges. Uh, one of them is the development of alternative pollinators in the near future. Uh, the, the best uh, chance we have is Bombus efipiatus, which has been in use uh, under a, a national or Mexican uh, brand, Efipol, in Jalisco, and is announced to be commercialized in 2015 by Copper. Uh, the other uh, species that is being uh, examined is Bomb Bombus hantii, also by Copper. And uh, another uh, uh, opportunity is to develop stingless bees as uh, greenhouse pollinators since uh, these bees are used to work at, at higher temperatures inside the greenhouses. And at least four species of stingless bees uh, have been tested in, in Yucatan for tomato and habanero chile pollination with promising results. And finally, the biggest challenge I see for the industry is the formulation of regulation, especially movement of pollinators and uh, sanitary regulation. And this has to be done with input from all interested parties. This means government, industry, growers, and academy. Thank you. Everyone, good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about the greenhouse. So uh, greenhouse use in Brazil is not as developed as in Canada and Mexico. Uh, mostly the greenhouses are 
made of plastic and uh, most of the time it's only the cover as you can see here in the picture this is a grape wine vineyard so the growers usually use this cover to protect the crops from injury of the weather like uh, storms or hail and uh, the use of this type of greenhouses is growing in Brazil because uh, the growers are getting used with better quality and higher value. Uh, however, uh, it's, the technology is not so developed yet. Um, and as the greenhouse it by itself is not as uh, developed, pollination in greenhouses is not very used in Brazil. Actually, green, uh, pollination, managed pollination is not used in general by growers because most of the time the growers uh, do not know the importance about pollination. And uh, what we know about pollination in greenhouses is from scientific experiments which tested for big B effectiveness. Uh, I will show you a little bit of uh, examples of these uh, studies and you see that most of them, I guess all of them, use stingless bees as uh, Africanized honeybees are not very attractive to be introduced inside the greenhouses because of the high defensive behavior and the bumblebees are not uh, managed in Brazil and that they also cannot be introduced here because there are laws for forbidding the introduction of exotic animals. So my first example is a review um, uh, that was published in 2006 and uh, here we have some crops that were studied until that year and some stingless bees that were tested. As we can see here, only six crops until that year were studied. And in these other slides from the same review, I highlighted here the stingless bee species that were tested in Brazil so far. And as we can see here, only two of six of these species did not adapt inside the greenhouses uh, and the adaptation was um, translated by the foraging or not inside the greenhouse. The first example I will give you is of Melipona quadrifaciata used it to pollinate greenhouse tomatoes and uh, it was done inside the polytechnic plastic houses and uh, first so the first thing I want to make a comment is that about the effect of confinement uh, it seems that it's colon dependent that is some colonies they uh, go better inside the greenhouse than others so the, these uh, workers they, they saw that four of six colonies gained mass, that is the hive, the colony increased in size, but two of them lost weight. Also, they checked that bee pollination was not as effective as they expected because it wa the yield was the same as no pollination, manual vibration, and B plus manual vibration. But, and uh, they attributed this to the low overlaps of foraging to a stigma receptivity. So as we can see here in this graph, here is the highest period of foraging and here is the highest period of flower receptivity. And as you can see here is only one half an hour to one hour of overlap. Um, I have some experience with the same stingless bee uh, uh, species. I introduced it inside a greenhouse of plastic greenhouse 
for an experiment on tomatoes. And after 45 days of being there, they did not visit the, the tomato flowers. So it may be that the, there is a, also a colony variation about the foraging in the inside the greenhouse. In another trial for my, during my PhD, it was a commercial greenhouse with the control of temperature. And also, I introduced four colonies. And after four, 45 days, there were no, no visits, except for one colony that started foraging after 20 days. And we noticed that this colony uh, lost 7.5% of its weight. So the confinement had a bad effect on this colony. And also, we noticed that Melitopona qualificata in, in that uh, greenhouse had a very low foraging rate, as we can see here per hour. Only we counted the, the number of bees leaving the hives, and the, the, most, the highest uh, forage activity was three bees leaving the hive. Um, another example is for Melipona subnitida, which was tested for the pollination of sweet pepper in northeast of Brazil. And uh, this, this bee, the colony started foraging after seven days only. They compared some uh, treatments, pollination treatments, and uh, they found out that uh, although these species could not increase fruit set, it increased the uh, fruit weight, the number of seeds, and reduced the fruit malformation in comparison with the greenhouses which did not have any colony. So it, this species is a candidate to be used in greenhouses, at least for sweet pepper. Uh, another example is for Melipuna fasciculata. Uh, and uh, the trials were done in this greenhouse. It's also covered with plastic. And um, in these studies, we, we found out that uh, this species is started, the colon that we tested, started to forage after four days of introduction, so very quickly. Uh, compared to the first one I showed you. And uh, we also noticed a high, highly, um, highly overlapped uh, period of the opening and the foraging behavior. Uh, also, we, as in tomato that um, Les told you, a single visit to the flower was enough to pollinate the, it adequately. And, uh, the bee pollination increased both yield and the quality of the fruits produced. And uh, after 30 days of confinement, the colony did not appear to have suffered from this period. It was uh, as strong as it was when we introduced it. But for the same species in an experiment for vibration, we noticed that the bees started forage only 40 day, 14 days after introduction. So the, the other try was four days. So it's, uh, it's highlighting that it might have um, differences among colonies. And uh, also it was interesting that uh, there were tomato, eggplant, pepper, and bell pepper plants inside the greenhouse, but these bees only visit the eggplant flowers. After the pollen was uh, gone, there was no pollen anymore, they started uh, flying on the roof and did not visit the other plant species. I got now moving to other uh, examples. Here we have an example for strawberry. Uh, Malago de Braga did some experiments and she tested these six stingless bee species and um, five, sorry, 
And uh, from this ex uh, species, Scaptotrigona did not forage under the greenhouse conditions, but the other three, although there was a reduction in the daily forage activity, uh, they for uh, foraging on the strawberry flowers. And, but uh, the highlight of this study was Tetragonista angustula, we call it uh, Jatai in Brazil. It had a very quick adaptation compared to the others, and uh, they kept a uh, satisfactory internal condition of the colonies. And also, it had a great impact in the reduction of the production of uh, fruits deformed, deformed fruits, and also it increased the weight of these fruits. Another species uh, tested for strawberry was Plebeia nigricipis by Viter and uh, other co-workers. They tested it inside the greenhouses that had only the covers, but they reduced it as we can see here, they reduced the foraging space, spaces to do the experiments. And uh, this, bee, this species of bee, it is very small, it has very small colony and adapt very well in small spaces. So it might be uh, maybe a, uh, a good choice for strawberry. And they were also effective pollinators. So. Uh, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, for greenhouses, we know still little compared to other countries. Um, we know that adaptation of stingless bees in greenhouses is possible, but it may be one of the greatest challenges for the use of them in this um, state. Um, almost always there was a negative effect on the colonies. and we still don't have any standard method of introduction for any species. So for future research, we should focus on the factors involved in the adaptation of stingless bees in greenhouse and the attraction of these different species to different crops. Also, in developing method, methods of introduction and management of stingless bees, and also consider the intra and interspecific variation when studying and using them for different crops. So I would like to thank you all for joining us. And uh, now I think we will be open for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Les and Carlos and Patricia, for a very interesting series of talks. I think we've, what we've seen is uh, uh, from uh, uh, the very sophisticated and highly seasonal um, issues that we have in Canada with uh, greenhouse um, pollination of, of uh, some uh, highly valued crops. We've seen what's going on in Mexico and a uh, great deal of, uh, of uh, new in, uh, new technologies are being introduced there and uh, then uh, uh, Patricia has told us a little bit about what's been going on in Brazil indicating that uh, indeed um, we have a lot of information to exchange and uh, lots of opportunity for collaboration. Um, so we have about 10 minutes to open for questions and I'm going to ask Victoria just to sort of moderate that for us so that uh, um, we can uh, um, interact either on the uh, screen, you'll see that there is a chat box down in the bottom left hand corner and uh, we will take questions in English, French, Spanish and Portuguese. Um, but uh, we may have some delays as uh, some in uh, languages that I'm not familiar with, which is uh, most of them. Um, 
would be translated for the benefit of everybody who's participating. So thank you very much, and uh, so we'll open the floor for some questions. Yep. Yes, uh, as you can see, there is a question about the application strategy of microbial agents. Is there any negative effect on the bees? Certainly, it depends on the microbial agent. Uh, Given an example is Bavaria bassiana. We had to look at different concentrations. We did not use the rate that's on the uh, actual product when they spray it. We had to actually lower the concentration because Bavaria is, is quite a generalist uh, microbial agent and would affect the bees if you used it at higher levels. Now with the viruses, certainly you don't have those issues. With uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, those issues are very minimal. And, and so it really depends on the agent and you need to evaluate every agent at the same time. Thank you. When it comes to supplemental lighting, uh, initially everybody's been looking at high pressure sodium lights. Uh, we also look at, uh, at uh, lead lights, that is light emitting diodes. Um, so yes, we need to know a little bit more about those. Probably when they look at supplemental lighting, it'll be a combination of both light sources that will be used. Yes, thank you for that question about uh, neonicotinoids and uh, their effects on bumblebees. Um, first of all, the different kinds of neonicotinoids have different effects on uh, on the bumble on the few bumblebees that have been tested. Um, so we know that that the different uh, products do uh, have uh, different effects, and of course, not very many bumblebees have been tested and a lot of sort of cross-testing and interactive testing between bumblebee species and the variety of nicotinoids on the market has uh, not really been done in a synthetic fashion um, so that we can give a definitive answer to that. But uh, I do know that there are some people asking those exact same questions. So at the moment, uh, we have to be a little circumspect in giving a, a definite answer on that although parts of it we can certainly uh, answer definitively. Well, that uh, in Canada, how do we treat the colonies at the end of the pollination service really depends. Um, if the grower has uh, asked for a pollination service by uh, Copert or BioBest, then those companies will get rid of the hives at the end of their uh, lifespan of the hives. They'll come in and, and dispose of them. If the grower has bought the hives himself, it's, it's really up to the grower. And this is something that needs to be, um, I guess we need to have some best management practices. So growers will dispose of the hives when they're, they're due uh, to be disposed of after, let's say, 12 weeks and not leave them in the, in the greenhouse. So. That's something that needs to be uh, worked out for growers. Um, yes, I think uh, there are no uh, bombus native uh, species to the Caribbean, so I would uh, recommend uh, introducing new species to the Caribbean. There are uh, other species which can be used in, uh, in greenhouses in this condition, for example, the carpenter bees or uh, English bees. Uh, I am, um, in general, opposed to introducing uh, exotic species without 
previous research. I'll jump in on this one again, and uh, the answer is not as far as we know. Um, there have been some uh, attempts, I suppose, to look at developing pesticide-resistant strains of honeybees, but as far as I know, certainly not of uh, any bumblebees that are used commercially in Europe or in North America. Well, on the question of bumbles in patients uh, competing with, uh, with bumblebees uh, present in the area, uh, we don't have any uh, indication so far, but in the survey conducted in Mexico, um, oh, I think Alfonso Torres from Copper is, is online now, so uh, he, he may have some, some more information on some of the questions. But we, we only collected out of the 8,000 uh, specimens in Mexico, only one uh, queen of bombus in patients. So the potential is there for the for es escaped bees to compete, but it, it has not happened yet. I, I can speak a little bit uh, for the Canadian situation. Um, we don't quite understand why, but Bombus impatiens has certainly spread into uh, the Maritime provinces, particularly into Nova Scotia, since about the 1920s, 1930s, when it was uh, either not recorded or has um, or was in low abundance. And now it's one of the more common species. And certainly in uh, our area of Ontario, we're seeing changes in the relative abundances of different species of bumblebees and impatience is uh, one of the most common native species and some of the other common native species are uh, becoming very very scarce what the cause and, uh, the cause and effect or uh, the cons what whether those are related is a matter of some debate uh, but various uh, things like uh, pathogen spillover have been implicated as has uh, climate change a complicated area I would like to add also on this, on this subject that um, one of the main uh, uh, dangers with an introduced species is the way that the growers dispose of the colonies. I don't know if Alfonso Torres could comment on, on what is the situation in Mexico as, as he knows it. The disposal of colonies by, um, by growers. Um, again, it, I, th there are very different national approaches to the use of bumblebees and particularly introduced bumblebees in the pollination of greenhouse crops. In Japan, um, they are very strict about not allowing bees to get out of the greenhouses into the wild. Um, and uh, in Canada, the rules are, are, are fairly constraining in terms of disposal as I am sure they are in Mexico, but it is, a, it is a difficult area and it's very difficult to prevent a bumblebee from escaping from a greenhouse. All it has to be is near the door as one walks out, as one walks into the greenhouse or out of the greenhouse and the bee follows or goes past uh, quickly. So 
certainly there's a lot of opportunity for um, for bumblebees to escape from greenhouses um, and to become uh, established, perhaps permanently or temporarily, or um, just not established at all in the vicinity of greenhouses. So it's it's an area of con of uh, continuing concern. No more questions. Um, am I on? Yes, uh, Jean, uh, Juan Carlos. That is uh, quite true. And uh, certainly in California, there have been some issues about uh, the uh, um, importation of bumblebees for outdoor crops uh, and pollination. And uh, those, those, uh, the risk analysis has been done on that. And uh, I think the decisions are, are that Yes, this is not something to be encouraged or uh, even allowed. Um, I, we're coming very close to the end of our one hour, um, so I would like uh, all the people who have been participants, I'd like to thank them very much for uh, being participants. Um, there has been the uh, o overriding thought amongst us here as the organizers of this webinar um, if another webinar on this same subject would be considered a useful thing to organize, we would be happy to try to organize that. And we would ask the participants and anybody who looks at this after the event today had any ideas as to where and specific topics that we might discuss um, in a more, uh, with uh, fewer presentations or, or shorter presentations and uh, more opportunity for general discussion. So in the meantime, I really want to uh, thank Victoria for putting this together. She's really been the, the techno wizard behind this and uh, has um, been just uh, uh, tremendously important in putting this together. We have uh, two more webinars coming up that the Canadian Pollination Initiative is organizing as a result of the meetings from the International Pollination Symposium in Cholula. And uh, one is on oilseed crops, and uh, that will be coming up next week. And also coming up next week will be one on poem crops. So uh, keep posted for those. And uh, now that we've gone through our very first one, we'll have a, a very good idea as to how to progress and make things a little more smooth than they have been, not that we've had very many um, upsets as we've gone on. So thank you so much for all your participation and all your questions. Okay.